Hello my dear children, Namaste and welcome to yet another biology session of our class 10 ICSE series. I'm Ambika, master teacher of biology right here at Vedantu. As you know, we are well into the chapter genetics, some basic fundamentals of the chapter genetics. We have already had a couple of sessions on the absolute basics of the chapter, which was all about Mendel's experiments, right? I kept on telling you and I'm still telling you that Mendel's experiments are actually the most important topic that you have to understand very clearly to understand anything else in this chapter. Okay, so I hope all of those ideas are clear in your head uh, well to be very honest this chapter to understand Mendel's experiments well enough you need a lot of practice with different kinds of um, problems genetic problems uh, we may not have enough time to practice a lot of them but uh, just in case any of you would like to have a session exclusively on that do let me know in the comment section here or do send me an email in case you have not understood how to go ahead with problems in genetics we can see if we could plan a session exclusively on that okay so keeping that in mind let's get started with the next topic of the chapter as you can see, it is all about sex-linked inheritance in humans. Okay, but since our uh, previous sessions were all a little concept heavy, it had a lot of uh, terms to remember, it had a lot of concepts to remember and a lot to get registered in your head, I intend to teach you um, new things very little today. So, although our, chap our topic for today is on sex-linked inheritance, let's make sure that we have understood the basics completely right. We need to know a lot of things before understanding sex linked inheritance one of the basics that you certainly need to know are like I said uh, Mendel's laws of inheritance how uh, Mendelian genetics works the second thing that you have to learn you have to understand is sex determination in humans so we will be discussing both of those um, before we go into the actual topic sex linked inheritance in humans but before that as always let's get started with a positive mindset what what I have to tell you today is just this push yourself because no one else is going to do it for you now as you know we teachers are here to give you a lot of guidance to give you a lot of motivation and our sincere hope is that you have been staying with us very sincerely and not just whiling away your time watching our videos and doing nothing else or following any of our instructions we are here to help you like I keep telling you your dream is also our dream which is why we are in this journey together so do remember this children keep pushing yourself because no one else is going to do it for you it's you who has to be completely in charge winners do not make excuses and those who do make excuses never win in the long run do remember that children and before we get started into the topic remember to download Vedanto's learning app if you haven't done that yet do join our telegram group and make sure you stay connected with us you have all the session pdfs and all those things and do remember to hit the like button if you think these sessions have been going great for you because ICSE exclusively for ICSE I think it's only now that we have been able to start a series and I hope all you ICSE children out there are very happy about it your physics chemistry and math teachers hopefully will be joining us soon and if you are very happy with our concept of this ICSE series do hit the like button right now and if you think our sessions are useful to any of your friends do remember to share it with them and please remember to subscribe to our channel Vedantu 9th and 10th because it's only been two weeks since we started we have a lot more waiting for you in the days to come to make sure you don't miss out on any of those stay tuned be a subscriber of our channel Vedantu 9th and 10th now we had a couple of homework questions in yesterday's session one of it was what is the genotypic ratio of Mendel's F2 generation of a dihybrid cross remember we learned all about monohybrid cross in the first session dihybrid cross in the second session and we have discussed what the phenotypic ratio would be in a dihybrid cross of the F2 generation 
what about the genotypic ratio? I did get some interesting answers from uh, Ragini Singh. 1 is to 2 is to 1 is to 2 is to 4 is to 2 is to 1 is to 2 is to 1 is the genotypic ratio according to Ragini. Um, Ronak here again says the answer is the same as Ragini. Isha has also given an answer but there's a slight difference in Isha's answer. There is a 3 instead of a 2 and a 1. Um, but before we see who has answered it correctly, let us understand what it is. Oh yes, and I shouldn't be missing this out. Ahana, um, I remember you very well, Ahana, from my previous sessions. You have been sending me emails, you have been uh, attending my live sessions, my premiere sessions, all of those. I remember your name very well. Ahana was sweet enough to uh, send me an email with both the answers. The other one she uh, attached uh, as a picture after uh, writing it uh, with hand like a handwritten uh, note uh, for the second question the first question she told me the answer is this one is to two is to two is to four is to one is to two is to one is to two is to one okay so thank you very much ahana for being a very very sincere student students like you keep teachers like me motivated and we wish to keep working harder and harder for children like you anyway let us look at what the correct answer would be now, this is the typical dihybrid cross of uh, Mendel. We have already seen that the phenotypic ratio of the F2 generation is 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. Now, the genotypes, how many different genotypes do you see in this Punnett square? I have listed that out also for you here. Have a look, children. I will stand in the middle so that you can compare the Punnett square with the genotypes that I have listed here. And how many times is each type of genotype being repeated? Those are the numbers that I have written against each of them. You see that a completely homozygous dominant, a double homozygous dominant genotype, capital R, capital R, capital Y, capital Y is coming only once. And that would be round yellow. Secondly, a capital R, small r and a capital Y, capital Y coming twice round yellow, right? So that is two. Capital R, capital R, small y, small y is coming just once, which is this. So we are done with these three. The fourth one, capital R, capital R, capital Y, small y is again coming twice as you can see here and here, okay? Now, a double heterozygous genotype is what we have next. You can see that four times. And if you really observe this, you see that all of them are forming the uh, diagonal of this Punnett square. It's even forming a pattern in that. Right? That is how a combination of uh, magic and logic or bio and logic work together in the case of genetics. Um, a lot of, um, you know, mathematical thoughts and calculations have gone behind explaining these principles, which is why it makes life easier for all of us today. Okay, so that is also done. We have a capital R, small r, small y, small y coming twice. And those are right here, round green. A small r, small r, capital Y, capital Y coming once, which is wrinkled yellow. And a small r, small r, capital Y, small y coming twice, which is wrinkled yellow and coming here. And of course, finally, a small r, small r, small y, small y, which is the double homozygous recessive genotype coming just once. Correct? Considering this, considering this, our F2 genotypic ratio would be 1 to 2 to 1, 2, 
four two one two one okay so isha because you said three somewhere instead of a one and two uh, please do go back and check if you have uh, arrived at your answer correctly see where you have gone wrong this is slightly confusing every time i look at it also because we don't tend to memorize this right it's so hard to memorize so it always makes sense to work it out by uh, logic Every time you want to find out this ratio, it's better to draw out the Punnett square, um, fill it up uh, using the gametic combinations and then sit and work out the ratio. Okay, so make sure you don't leave any of this because there are four alphabets, right? Four alphabets, of course, two alphabets, but four different versions, a capital and a small of each of them. Because of that, we have 16 different squares. So it's easy to go wrong in that. And Ahana, again, your answer was also correct. The only difference was that your order was different, right? I think uh, this is the easiest order to remember. If you actually look at it, those of you who want to memorize it, of course, this is not the ideal thing to uh, memorize. But just in case you want to make sure you're writing the correct answer remember that in the middle of the ratio would be four and on either side it's one two one two and two one two one remember it like that one to two to one to two to four two one two one okay this will be Mendel's F2 dihybrid ratio this would be the case with all typical dihybrid crosses any cross that you take typically this would be your result in the F2 generation. Okay, I hope it's completely clear to you. You shouldn't have any questions in your mind. Just in case you are confused with anything, children, do remember to post your doubts right now in the comment section. I will be addressing them after this session or whenever I find some time, uh, not exceeding two days, okay, positively. So let us go ahead. The next question that I had asked you was this. If you have a tall pea plant, how would you identify its genotype given that capital T and small t are the dominant and recessive alleles respectively? Okay. I'm not sure how many of you completely understood this question. Uh, I didn't get many answers for this. Uh, the first answer that I got was from uh, Somesh who said if the gamete formed as capital T, capital T, it will be a tall plant. Um, Somesh, thank you for uh, attempting to answer this. Uh, but it's not completely making sense because first of all, the gamete, one gamete in a monohybrid cross would include just one letter or one allele. So a gamete could have only capital T if it's homozygous tall. And my question here is, you have no idea about the genotype. You're just phenotypically given a tall plant. And we know that if a plant is expressing the dominant trait, its genotype can either be homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant. Correct? This is exactly my question. How do you find out if that plant given to you is homozygous for height or heterozygous for height? So what exactly we have to find here is just this. Whether the plant given to you has the genotype this or this. What if someone had given you a dwarf plant? you can be very safe, you can say very safely that its genotype will be nothing apart from this. A homozygous plant, a plant or an organism expressing the homozygous trait is certainly homozygous recessive because a recessive gene can express itself only in the homozygous condition. In case it was present in the heterozygous condition, physically that organism would have expressed the dominant trait like in this case. So the only thing we are sure about is that a dwarf plant's genotype is this. A tall plant, we don't know if it's this or this. How do we find this out? Because there is something that we are sure about we test it using that. But anyway, uh, 
Ahana also gave me the answer to this question, which was very well explained. Uh, Ahana's email said, uh, ignore or uh, forgive me for any grammatical errors. Uh, that is completely uh, understandable, Ahana. That is not what uh, matters. To me, what matters is uh, the, how well explained your answer is, how well described your answer is. And I see that your answer is very reasonably well explained. Ignore everything else. It doesn't matter at all. As long as the answer is scientifically correct, I would give full marks to that answer. Okay, so this is the picture that Ahana sent me. Um, and this is completely making sense. I will also be explaining this to you because the brightness is perhaps slightly less uh, in this image. Let us go ahead. But thank you very much, Ahana. Once again, highly appreciated your efforts. Do keep it up and keep going. Now, coming back to the question, let us work this out together now. To find out a tall plant's genotype, the only thing that you can do is to cross it with a short plant or a dwarf plant because the genotype here is certainly this. This can be either this or this. Now what is the next step? These are the parents. There are two possibilities. Let us split it up into the two possibilities in case this parent was this homozygous uh, for tall and our other parent is this, what would the F1 generation be? We would get only and only tall plants, correct? All of them would be tall. But if this was a heterozygous tall plant and you cross it with a dwarf plant, what are your gametes? You have these as the two gamete possibilities in this case and in this case you have only this possibility. So obviously in the F1 generation you could have either this combination which is capital T small t or you could have a combination of these which is a small t small t which basically means that you have a 50-50 ratio in the F1 generation in the second case in the heterozygous case. 50% of them would be tall and 50% of them would be dwarf. So this is the best method and this again was developed by the intelligence and smartness and curiosity of our hero of genetics who was Gregor Johann Mendel himself. Okay, so this is also called test cross because it is used to identify an unknown genotype okay we are testing we are doing a cross in order to test the genotype of an unknown organism this is exactly why Mendel decided to call this a test cross okay so remember children this is a standard rule that if you have to identify an unknown genotype all you have to do is cross it with a recessive parent cross it with a completely recessive parent and based on your observation in the F1 generation like you see here I have put it in Punnett squares so that it will be easier for you to understand case 1 and case 2 that we just uh, explained in the previous slide it's the same thing in the form of a Punnett square after crossing the unknown parent with the double recessive parent in your test cross Observe the F1 generation. In your F1 generation, if you see that all of the F1 progeny or the offspring express only the dominant character, you can be sure that the unknown genotype of the parent was homozygous dominant. In case your F1 progeny have shown 50% tallness and the remaining 50% of them showed the recessive trait, you can conclude safely that the unknown genotype of the parent was heterozygous. Remember children, this is again a very important concept. It is called the test cross, the name you see on top there, test cross. Okay, now let us go ahead and have a quick quiz to recap some of the things that we have done so far. Which of these is the typical Mendelian dihybrid F2 phenotypic ratio? 
Be very quick. This is not a hard question at all. Mendelian dihybrid F2 phenotypic ratio. 4, 3, 2, 1. And the answer is 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. The next question, which of these is based on Mendel's dihybrid experiments? Yes, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 and go. The answer is law of independent assortment because we learned that the law of dominance and the law of segregation are based on Mendel's observations on his monohybrid crosses. Law of independent assortment was exclusively based on his dihybrid experiments. What about option B, law of purity of gametes? That is just another term for law of segregation. Okay, so keep this in mind, a very, very basic thing because you may be asked in your exam to state Mendel's laws, any of the laws or all of the laws, depending on the marks. Now, the next question, slightly tricky, but important to know if the dihybrid genotype of an individual is this, capital A, small a, capital B, capital B, the possible types of gametes are. So remember children, the rule that I told you yesterday, in a dihybrid cross, how do you form the gametes? Keep that in mind. If you have attended that session of mine, and if you have understood that concept very clearly, you will not go wrong with this question. Those of you who give me the wrong answer here, please go back to yesterday's session and have a look at that particular part once again where I explain how the gametes have to be formed in a dihybrid cross. Okay, and our answer is B, capital A, capital B, small a, small b. Just for the information of those of you who can't recall it, uh, when you are given a dihybrid genotype, the simple rule to keep in mind is that a gamete would have one allele of each of your two genes. In this case, A and B are your two genes. What are the alleles? Capital A, small a are the alleles for A gene. Capital B, small b are the alleles for your B gene, right? But whatever it is, the given genotype to you in the case of A, right, has capital A as the dominant allele and small a as its recessive allele. What about the B gene? In this case, it's got only the dominant allele. The small, the recessive allele does not exist in this genotype. So that doesn't matter at all. Anyway, none of our options has that. So how do you form the gametes for this? You need to have at least one allele of each of these genes. So obviously the answer would be capital A, capital B in one gamete and small a, capital B in another gamete. I hope this is very, very clear. In case it's not, like I said, go back to the previous session, have a look at it once again and then come back and ask me if you have any further questions. Okay, so this is how you find out what gametes exist, what gametes can be formed when a genotype is given to you. Okay, so let us go ahead. A homozygous purple flower variety of pea plant is crossed with white flower variety of pea. The phenotype and genotype of the F1 generation of offspring would respectively be dash and dash. The phenotype and genotype. Take your time. Not your own time, the time that I give you. Which will be 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 and go. Let's see how many of you have got it right and the correct answer is option C, purple, capital P, small p. We are talking about a homozygous purple flowered variety, which means it's this, right? The genotypes are given to you is crossed with this. The progeny, the F1 progeny, this is very simple, would all be this genotypically phenotypically because they have at least one purple allele they would all be purple 
and because in my question I'm asking you the phenotype first and then the genotype and asked you to write them in the respective order our answer would be C because purple is the phenotype the heterozygous genotype is the answer for the second part of the question so C is our answer here okay now okay let's get started with today's topic and as I told you it is very very important to understand uh, all about chromosomes all about sex chromosomes before understanding how sex determination works and how sex linked inheritance works so this is something that we have learned in the previous chapter cell cycle about the types of chromosomes right remember children chromosomes can either be autosomes or they can be sex chromosomes what are autosomes we have to find this earlier but just to recap autosomes are all of those chromosomes in your cell that uh, do not determine your sex or your gender all of them are called autosomes what about sex chromosomes in human beings there are two types of sex chromosomes which are X and Y we have discussed all of these in our previous chapter right so to get better perspective of this let us look at this particular image this is an image of the karyotype what is karyotype uh, well uh, sounds like a complex word but uh, just understand that it's just um, uh, an image that shows the arrangement or the chromosomal pattern in typical cells okay so this is the human male karyotype and this is the human female karyotype okay why is it important to understand this um, well it is to get better perspective into the idea that each of our diploid cells contains all of these chromosomes for example a typical diploid human male cell okay would contain all of these chromosomes you can see that the chromosomes are numbered right you can see that there are 22 pairs of autosomes right you can see that there are 22 pairs of autosomes what is the last pair the 23rd pair forms the sex chromosomes which are one X chromosome and one Y chromosome in the case of a human male and you can see that that is where the difference lies in a human diploid female cell wherein there are of course 22 pairs of autosomes but the number of sex chromosomes will be slightly different it will be one pair of X chromosomes or two X chromosomes remember another question that I asked you earlier how many uh, pairs of homologous chromosomes are found in a human sperm cell this is the difference in the case of a human female it would be 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes because the sex chromosomes are also identical to one another because it's two X chromosomes in the case of a male on the contrary the autosomes are all homologous but the sex chromosomes are heterologous or they are different from each other you can see that the X chromosome is much longer as compared to the Y chromosome one more important thing to understand one very basic thing to understand children is that each of these chromosomes carries genes the points that you see here the darkened points that you see here on each of the chromosomes represent markings of the genes so each of your genes on each of your chromosomes is responsible for each of our characteristic features each of these genes say for example chromosome 1 would contain genes for one particular set of traits one particular set of characters chromosome 2 would contain it for another set of characters and so on right this is important to understand in order to uh, start with the basics of sex linked inheritance but before that let me ask you one question now those of you who have been sleeping in my class please wake up and start looking at this and think about the first time in your life that you recall having taken part in a race perhaps in your uh, kindergarten when you were in LKG some of you UKG first grade or first standard 
for some of you probably preschool or even before that with your siblings whatever it is i just want you to recall that moment but the interesting thing here is that that was actually your first race but a race happened related to you even before that which was between the sperm and egg before you were formed as a zygote in mom's uterus as a typical diploid zygote in mom's uterus this race happened because always if you are familiar with how the female reproductive cycle works of course we have a chapter on that we will be discussing that well in detail but if you remember something from your lower grades you would know that during one one cycle one female reproductive cycle between a menstrual cycle and an ovulation cycle once again but if you recall something from your lower grades you would be able to recall that during one ovulation there would be just one egg typically that is produced in a female reproductive system okay that is the egg that i have represented here in pink this pink the middle one and what happens is semen or the male gametes are always formed in millions of numbers and during copulation what happens is the semen get released into the vagina and all the sperms in the semen the millions of sperms in fact race through the female reproductive tract in order to reach and fertilize that one single egg okay so it's millions of sperms competing to reach the target which is one single female egg cell which is why they are all saying i'm first i'm first okay anyway the important thing to understand here is that since a sperm cell pay attention children very very important concept since a sperm cell would contain either an x chromosome or a y chromosome remember gametes contain only one sex chromosome right sperm would contain either x or y so considering that we can say that roughly 50% of the sperms that are released uh, during copulation carry the x chromosome imagine that all of these sperms are carrying the x chromosome and what about the remaining half right the remaining half of the sperms carry the y chromosome right as their sex chromosome understand this children very very important what about the egg cell what does the egg cell carry the egg cell always carries only the x chromosome right if you have understood this much the rest of it is going to become very very easy for you what i'm trying to say is that by default an egg cell is destined to become only a female baby so what decides whether a child is born as a male or a female it is definitely the sperm that decides it sperm is the deciding factor in determining the sex in human beings because whoever succeeds in this race whoever wins this race whichever sperm wins this race if the winner sperm is one that carries an x chromosome x and x fuse together and that develops into a female baby on the contrary if it's a y carrying sperm that manages to race and reach first it develops into xy which is a male baby or a baby boy okay very important thing to understand children have a look at this also this is the race and this uh, sperm all of these are sperm okay this they are all running through the female reproductive tract this is an x carrying sperm these two are y carrying sperm of course it's not just the three of them there are millions of them that follow some of them are said to die off on their way itself uh, but ultimately one of them would win the race and depending on whether that is an x carrying sperm or a y carrying sperm the sex of the fetus is decided 
okay so this is a summary of what we have discussed until now the egg cell always carries the x chromosome which is why it's this if an x carrying sperm fertilizes it the xx combination comes in the diploid zygote that develops into a girl or a female baby remember these symbols are important this is the symbol for female and this is the symbol for male and if the y carrying sperm fertilizes the egg it develops into the combination xy which becomes a baby boy okay so i hope this is very very clear and in india if you know children i just want to uh, talk about this also at this point um, in india generally there is an idea that it's better to have a baby boy than a baby girl in many parts of india i'm not saying in general of course times are changing now and there was a time when um, the sex of the fetus used to be determined during pregnancy itself and unfortunately we have heard of many sad stories wherein if it was decided if it was um, uh, found if it was identified as a baby girl the baby would be aborted in the uterus itself only if it's a baby be boy would the baby be allowed to come into this world which is why legally in india sex determination during pregnancy is banned sex determination is not allowed at all legally in india of course in other countries they do uh, identify the sex because they don't have problems like female feticide and all of those things but in india this is banned and i want all of us to be well aware of this so that we have a much healthier and a much better india we want whether it's a girl or a boy it's a gift from god right i want all of us indian citizens to come to that mindset whatever it is the world cannot survive the world cannot exist without either of these we need an equal population pretty much equal population of girls and boys so let us allow every baby to be born into this world okay that is why i have also put this picture here of course it's not related completely to our session today but let us make sure we at least if something is in our control or if we know somebody who uh, does female feticide or something like that let us stand against it very strongly okay now another interesting cartoon look at this it's simpsons again this guy says as you can see this dad simpson has a bald head and he is like oh no only men are bald and that's not fair and his wife says well blame your genes honey and their son is like oh no which means he's scared that he might also become bald like his dad when he grows up have you also noticed this children why is it that baldness is seen mostly in men usually you don't see women who are bald unless it's some kind of a um, hormonal deficiency or something like that mostly baldness is a character that you see only in men right and usually if a man is bald he would have inherited that from his father and there are very good chances that he would pass it on to his son also right so why does this happen um in fact that is just an example of um, male sex chromosome related inheritance there are also certain cases there are also a lot of examples wherein some characters or some traits are related only to females okay that is exactly what we are going to study today sex linked traits just like the name tells you sex linked traits what i mean is that like you see you have uh, i have put an x chromosome and a y chromosome here so like we saw in the karyotype image earlier there are genes on every chromosome that decide different individual unique traits right those traits whose genes pay attention children those genes sorry those traits whose genes are carried by the y chromosome are called y linked traits and those traits whose genes are carried only by the x chromosome are called x linked traits and in general those characters that are carried only by the sex chromosomes either x or y are what we call as sex linked traits okay sex linked traits are basically sex chromosome related traits okay and 
the inheritance of sex linked traits is what we call sex linked inheritance as i told you earlier with the example of baldness there can be y linked traits such as male pattern baldness and there can also be x linked traits examples for x linked traits are uh, two disorders which we know as hemophilia and color blindness now what are they let us look at that we'll just understand what that is hemophilia is basically a blood related disorder wherein the affected person the affected individual uh, does not have the ability to clot blood so basically it's a very very dangerous thing because even if there is a minor cut in such a person's body there will be uncontrolled bleeding because the blood is unable to clot right only if blood clots can there be a plug and further loss of blood can be prevented right so in a hemophiliac person in a patient suffering from hemophilia which is related to the x chromosome right we will understand how it is inherited in our next session but in such a person blood clotting does not happen this is what is hemophilia okay and in this case red green color blindness color blindness uh, basically from the name you can guess it color blindness is a condition wherein um, a person the affected person is unable to uh, you know make out the difference between certain colors among all color blind people in the world a good majority of them are said to be suffering from red green color blindness what exactly is that now look at this image how many of you see the green and the red very clearly it may seem very obvious to uh, people like us people like me also who can see both of them very clearly you're like oh, what is the confusion do people even do not see the red color in it but yes there are a lot of people who cannot easily make out the difference between red and green i have uh, also heard a story from one of my teachers who said that her uh, that she and her son are color blind not like they uh, uh, completely or always see red and green in the same way but she uh, i remember her telling in the class that uh, when her son was driving um, in um, new york if i remember right um, he got confused when the traffic signal came like between red and green and it was actually a red signal but he somehow for a fraction of a second thought that is a green signal and he just uh, drove off and uh, got into some kind of trouble but anyway uh, it's it may seem funny for people who uh, can easily make out the difference but for those of you who do get confused between these two just blame your genes you have got it from your parents and it's been running in the family that is why you are also unable to make out this difference of course compared to hemophilia color blindness is certainly not at all a life threatening thing hemophilia is certainly a life threatening disease right and an interesting thing about hemophilia an interesting case of hemophilia is a well known one which is the royal family of england queen victoria's family in england has been well known to have been running um, to have been having the hemophilia gene in her family we will look at details of all of that in our session tomorrow because there are a lot of interesting things and a lot of logic to be considered we can't just rush through that let us understand the inheritance patterns step by step anyway in your syllabus it's mainly x linked diseases that are commonly asked in your exam y linked diseases are normally not asked but just remember that an example is male pattern baldness okay now coming to a summary of what we have learned today well yes it's just these three new things that we have learned chromosomes are either of two types autosomes or sex chromosomes secondly sex linked traits are those whose genes are found along the x chromosomes either found along the sex chromosomes which means either the x or the y chromosome hemophilia and color blindness are examples of x linked inheritance because the genes for them are found only on the x chromosome how it happens where it happens why it happens we will look at the details of all of that in our next session but before that i want to give you a homework question again 
if a gene is present only on the Y chromosome, can both sons and daughters inherit it from their father? Explain your answer. Uh, well, based on your understanding of our session so far, based on any new understanding or applying your logic to uh, what you've understood so far, I want you to come up with a lot of answers. Ahana, thank you once again. I will be looking forward to receive uh, to receiving more and more answers like Ahana's sincere uh, uh, from sincere children like uh, her. So thank you very much, children, for staying so active and being in touch with me. Do remember to download Vedantu's learning app. Stay in touch with us through the Telegram group and download your session PDFs as well. And if you found the session useful, do remember to hit the like button, share it with your CBSE friends and state board friends also because they also have this topic in their syllabus. Do remember to subscribe to our channel Vedantu 9th and 10th right now because this is just our second chapter. We will be doing the remaining bio chapters in the days to come and your other subject teachers will also join us. So make sure you don't miss out on anything that we have in store for you. Keep working hard children, stay motivated and in the meantime, if you want any help from my side, Please do remember to send me an email at my email id ambika.gopalakrishnan at vedantu.com. So in our session tomorrow, we will be continuing with sex-linked inheritance in a much more interesting and fun session. Until then, happy studying and this is Ambika signing off.